people welcome their uh, lady and gentlemen and uh, this is our final session of the day and we've saved the best for last this is uh, experiences with embedding nagios on raspberry pi and uh just so for you guys coming in um if you haven't been in this room with me we're going to do a q a when we're done um we've it's worked best if you just just raise your hand if you got a question i'll run over there with the microphone because Everything is being recorded. We want to make sure we get both ends, the question and the answer, not just the answer, all right? So try and raise your hand, and I'll run over there with the microphone and get it to you. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the microphone over. Actually, he's got his own no microphone, problem. so you're good to go. Dave Williams. Well, thank you very much for that. Let's get started. Um, simple topic, you'd think, putting Nagios on a pie. Uh, as in all good presentations, we'll do the agenda. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you it, and then I'm going to tell you what I've told you. And at that point, some of it might have stuck. So let's kick off. There'll be my ego slide. There's always one in every presentation, seeing how marvellous I am. Uh, some chat about the Raspberry Pi, for those who aren't familiar. Uh, okay. I'll move that way. I'll move this way. A bit about the Raspberry Pi, and then what I've called a recipe, because it's a pie, uh, about building Nagios on the Raspberry Pi. Um, a kind of proof of concept building DNX. Uh, one of the things about the Raspberry Pi is obviously you've only got a little dinky little processor. But if you want to do big jobs, then you've got to have more than one of those. So my particular technique has been, let's just pile them, stack them high, sell them cheap, which is another message. And then I'm going to skate on thin ice whilst being on a tripwire and do a live demo with the pie that's in the middle there, which I will tell you now has a very dodgy power supply. So let's all hope it works. Then it, the, the most interesting part of this presentation is really going to be about the future. What can you do with this thing? What might you want to do with this thing? What has been done with it so far? So you can get an idea of more or less anything. And for those of you who like stealing street furniture, traffic, light, traffic cones, just the thing for you. Uh, okay, uh, my background, mainframe Unix networking. Uh, I work for a French computer manufacturer, and you have no idea how much pleasure that brings to a man from the UK to work for the French. <laughs> but I try to overlook it. Um, the parent company is, uh, makes its own kit, uh, mainframes, high performance computing, minis and managed services, whatever. What do I do? Uh, system monitoring, where I've been. Uh, OpenView, obviously, uh, NetView, OpenMaster used to be our product. Um, so these are all enterprise. These are, these are the umbrella products that like take over big enterprises and cost big enterprises big money. Uh, and where did I kick off with Nagios? NetSaint on ALX, I was one of the first guys to port it. It was just fun. Um, and that was one of, one of life's, I'm going to get this in for the benefit of the serendipitous accidents. As much as I wanted a network monitoring system, I couldn't afford to remount OpenView and I had an AIX server sitting next to me. Job done. So let's get on to the Raspberry Pi. Um, for those of you who don't know about it, it's in some little box there. It's a little credit card sized computer. And its reason for being, or I say I work for a French company, a raison d'etre, is to actually educate children. It was the, the guy who's, who worked on this, uh, which is Eden Upton, were taking in graduates at Cambridge who seemed to be incapable of coding. They couldn't quite get a do-for loop together. And this is just craziness. They're very good at doing Excel, and they could do a bit in VB, because that's just drag and drop, but... And it became apparent that there seemed to be no way of teaching young children how to code. And one of the obstacles is that if you've got a six, seven hundred pounds computer, the last thing you want to do is to give it to a child and say, do what you like with that. You know, rewrite it, do anything, create stuff, blow it up. Oh, maybe not. And so they were set forth to build a computer that was disposable, had enough body strength ability to be interesting so that the results of the child keying away would be interesting to them, would be motivational, but 
he didn't matter if they poured their coke all over it. And that's the raspberry pie. What does it look like? Uh, it looks like that. Everything you need for a computer. Uh, USB, well, if you want to put a keyboard or something on, that'll be good. LAN connection, because you have to be somewhere. Audio, because you want to listen to things. Um, RCA video, because not everybody's got HDMI, which is the other main output. And then a RAM. Now, that rather attractive picture it shows that little square in the middle with the, with the GPU and the CPU. And unfortunately, that's a layer because underneath it is the memory. So it's actually the manufacturer, memory, <laughs> CPU soldered together. So you're not going to be upgrading this one very easily. Um, it's a great little, but nice, powerful machine, really obvious. And the thing I like about it is in the left hand corner, GPIO, general purpose IO. At long last, we're back to the stages where I can stick a piece of wire on a PC and go, I can make that wire do stuff. Where are they? Raspberry Pis, bless them. Um, all over the place, it would seem. Uh, when you get a pie, if you're, you're invited to register your purchase, um, these are the people who have. So all over the world. Um, majority in the UK, 4,900. Scattered across the US of A, even down in Brazil, Chile, Argentina, they, they've all found their way around to these places. Uh, if you want to look at RAS track, you'll see it being updated. All right, my demo system, which I'm going to show you, um, is running flavors of Debian. So the one we're going to watch is obviously running Squeeze. And the next release will be Wheezy. These are reasonable ports. The squeeze port works. Okay, it's a working system. We're all very happy with it. It'll work better under Wheezy because Wheezy's been optimized for the floating point instruction set. So the kernel on this one will fly, basically. And there's a couple of other kernel drivers that have been put in that are quite interesting. Right now, we're playing on a pretty, pretty slow kernel. But it does the job. But it's not, that, it's not optimized, which is true. There are other kernels available. Obviously, you can put Fedora, if you're really that sad. Um, you can put an optimized version of Debian called Raspbian on, which is flies like a rocket, but has no real repositories for you to get decent software. And for those of us of a certain age and a certain origin, you can load Riscos, which was the old operating system on the BBC Micro which was absolutely endemic in the UK and nowhere else. Right, this is the recipe. We're going to build ourselves an Agios server on a Raspberry Pi. How do we do that? Well, pretty much the way it tells you to do it in the documentation set. So your first port of call should be how it's done, which is not bad because most of it works, which is cool because it gives you something to start. So it's already there. This, for those who build Nagios, should be amazingly familiar. Apart from the odd thing, I think, why in God's name am I having been forced to install IPU ports? Well, and things like that. Aren't they there already? Well, the answer is no. This is a minimal operating system. It's this big. It doesn't have these things on it. So then we do the usual things. We trudge our way through, you add in users, creating everything, thinking it's all going to be lovely. Oh, whoops. If I want those pretty pictures, and I'm a man for pretty pictures, let's not be wrong, uh, I'll be needing GD utils, which isn't an instruction set, so you'll have to go and find it and build it and install it. This is not a problem. It's just like when you get the slide set. If you sit in front of a slide set and follow the rules, at the end will come a working system, kind of. And then... Just take the Nagio source and compile it. There's nothing, there's nothing scientific about this. There's nothing um, mysterious or magical. Um, the config file correctly detects the processor type, makes the right optimization moves, and away you go. Because it's Debian, you have to force a lot of things on in terms of the config file. 
the room flies. Things that, things that threw me, because I come from a different flavour of Linux, were things like calling the web server Apache 2, you know, as long as it's not HTTPD, O. Um, everything else works. It puts all the permissions on. That's no good. As we all know, once you've built it, you may indeed build it, but they will not necessarily come because it won't be doing a damn thing because you haven't put the plugins on yet. So once you've built it and you've got the plugins, go get them, nothing scientific, go get the latest version, and go build them. So, so far, it's a standard install. Then the fun starts. Uh, I decided that I'll have a go at sharing this out, so I want DNX. Off we go, we get DNX. Charmingly, there's a nice script that lets you commission and start DNX. Um, does the automatic stuff, copy stuff around, and this is the basic instruction set for it. Get the script, run the script, Confit, run it so on the server, run it on the client, and you know, everything's going to work. Oh, of course, possibly not, actually. Um, and this is just accidents of nature, I like to call them. Remember right back in the beginning, I said we had to force IP utils on. Well, strangely enough, in this release, you don't get IP tables. So mucking about with IP tables in a script when it doesn't exist is kind of erroneous. The wget happens to work in a slightly different way. It's just life. Um, but you get over it. Once you get over these small things, you get that. So now we have a system that is actually a Raspberry Pi and a number of other worker Raspberry Pis. When we considered workers in, in the terms of Magios, we always think it's another task, it's another process. Well, in this case, it's actually another physical box. And it is literally that kind of thing. I just another one, another one, another one. Who knows it? This really is. You can actually make this into horizontal or vertical scaling because it just depends which way are you stack the boxes. <laughs> right, there's the brave bit. Uh, let's see if we can find a system. Ooh. And well, that looks like a system. It's all going to look like a system. Right. Should we not do it? Should we use it? That's right, Yuri. You know the thing about never doing live demos? You should never do a live demo. That doesn't look like it's there. That's me. That's me. That's because... Start Nagios up. And what we can see there is Nagios server coming up, the DNX server is running. I'm already running a check ping on something that might actually respond in a moment. It's just a straightforward thing, guys. It's not hard. There's no, there's, there's no difficulty about it. It's just stepping back, doing the steps. And when you get that, that interesting problem, not panicking, which is about what you're going to see me do. There we go. That's much better. There's our, there's our system starting up at last. Now that didn't hurt, did it? That's, that's it working. So I'll do the next problem. I've got DNX up. I've got Nagios up. If I go and look at... So that is a working Nagios instance just flying. It's not doing anything at all. So let's have a look at. How busy is it? Not really. I mean, it's only doing one check, but it's actually up. It's running. It's running quite quickly. I've just put a load on it while running the top, as you do. It's a very conventional and straightforward system. So there's nothing mystical about it. Just getting the, the, the right things right. 
and we'll, we can have a whole discussion about what right things are, because we'll talk later about the hardware level. But this software level, Nagios doing it, distributing it, it's very straightforward. Now that it's working, I'm going to stop it. And you're wondering, now that I've actually got it to work, why am I doing that? Literally is talking about embedding Nagios again, so old one out. New one in. So, what's happened there? What I've done, I've just changed the disk on this system. Just like, does that give you a clue how disposable this system is? I've just put maybe a $10 disk in that picture, if that. Now, this thing's doing well. Of course, it is a live demo. It will boot up. I do confess I'm going a long way to show you one screen, but I think it's worth it. That's a good. Remember what I called it, secure screen. Good. Indeed. Get that in there. Yep, it should be up there, so let's try a new one. Let's see if I can use both. You can probably guess the standard password ID thing. I'm just ever so glad they just didn't make the logging raspberry because that would have been even worse. Okay. One of the interesting side effects of a Raspberry Pi is, of course, as uh, the message tells you, it doesn't have a real-time clock. You have decided that it was too expensive to actually put a real-time clock and the required battery on the system. Close enough. 
absolutely right, because I'd like to show, show the log actually being... Give it the right way round. That'll be handy, wouldn't it? Really. Good. And now. Right. Let's move over to there. Let's go to the new image. That's correct, it's not called that because it's actually called that. The point being, <laughs> you can take the beta of Nagios 4 and you can run it on a Raspberry Pi. Click an event book. You'll see this lovely line here. And it has spawned 4. It is the real thing. It is doing that. So not only is it small, capable, and fairly easy to configure, it also tracks the release candidate for Nagios 4. In the next release of the operating system for the Raspberry Pi, there are optimizations available. So right now, this system will maybe may hold on to 150, 250 hosts, 10, 12 services each on its own, use DNX, stack them. Next release, we get the chance to overclock the processor. It's running at 762 at the moment. Dynamically, there's a kernel driver that says you can detect if you're under strain and turn it up to a gig. And then when you finish doing what you're doing, turn it back down again. Which well, seems to me to be a cracking event handler for Nagios. And I'm a bit busy. I need more power. You know, when I'm not busy, I'll turn it down. So all that kind of plays into, it's a real product, it's a really nice piece of kit, it does what you want to do, there's no reason not to use it, it's not ended in any way. Yes, <coughs> I've got to say that was only working for since about three days ago, <laughs> but it does work. And uh, actually I have Daniel to thank for, thank for that because I took his RPMs and his source RPMs and kind of played a bit. And Got there. Right, so, hang done always happens on live demos, broken it several times. What else is there to say? Well, there's no reason to not use this for strange things. Now, when you talk about system monitoring, someone always comes up with this phrase, have a traffic light display, red and amber and green, well, how about this one? Red and <laughs> green. Yeah, real traffic light. Okay. Now, this is what I was saying about if you went to the, you know, in your youth, stealing street furniture, such as traffic lights and cones. Well, here's a good use for your, what you might find in your wardrobe. Wired up to that. Like, stuff I really do quite fancy. One of those in the operations centre. Look, it's a green light. Yes, it's a green light. Yeah. But that's just, why not? Why not? Circuitry to do it is just trivial. Okay, it's a set of, in my case, mains voltage resistor relays and a control circuitry, each one hanging off a pin off the GPIO. Remember we had the GPIO pins? Admittedly, I've lost four here out of the 16, but nonetheless, that's it. That's all it is. It's a bit of Vero breadboard with some relays in. Really easy. You know, take away the circuit diagram. So what else can I do? Well, obviously, you know, if I can do signs, why don't I do rolling text signs? I've always wanted to have something that said DEFCON 1, scrolled at the top uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a control center. If you want to do digital signage, it's a great phrase, and it really means those horrible 42-inch screens you see in people's receptions where it's just going, it gives you the, the, the company message. You know, we, it, well, you can do it with this as well. 
But in this, of course, you can put real stuff in. You know, all of our, you know, we are a company to trust because 100% of our servers are up. Or you might want to think, think again, 47% of our servers are up. You could do that. <laughs> Maybe not in your reception, but it gives you a chance to do something different. This is a mother of a supercomputer, um, which I did work on. It's called Terra 100. Right now, it figures as number 17 in the top 500 most powerful computers ever. It was number six. This doesn't quite figure in the same scale, but it's roughly the same thing. This is 64 Raspberry Pis put together using message parsing interface, which is the proper way you do things in an HPC, to be a supercomputer. The young lad on the right was the consultant who built the Lego frames, because as you've noticed, Raspberry Pis come kind of free. They wave around in into a figure. He did the Lego work to make it into a rack. Now, the point is, he only delivers an absolutely minimal amount of flops to actually do anything. What it does give you is 64 nodes where you have to learn about properly distributed computing. You have to learn about message passing. You have to learn about cache coherency. You can't do it. It does that work for you. Now, that teaching tool costs just about $3,000 to build, and it is plugged in. It uses enough power for one power socket. That's all it takes. Now, you compare that to a similar number of pizza box servers you string together to do that same job, and there is no comparison. You learn the same software techniques, the same coding techniques, but just much cheaper. So that's possible. I mean, you, people will say, can I put a Beowulf cluster in? And yes, of course you can. That'll be 64 tonne of servers you find from somewhere, each with a plug in the back, or maybe two. And think of the space, think of the heat, think of the power. Think of that, sitting there, doing nothing, just not needing cooling, not needing much power. I mean, that'll run off. Lead cell batteries, almost forever. What else can you do with it? How about putting your own PABX on it? Now, I like that one because one of the things that I have with Nagios customers is they quite like to be told when things are broken. And the, you know, the first thing you, they say is, send me an email. Yes, what if the email's the thing that's broken? Yeah. Can, you, can you send me a text message? Yes, I can. Would you like to be rung up by a phone with a voice telling you what the message is? Yes, I would. Well, there you are then. Most people do it with Asterix. You can do it with this kind of software. You could have one of these boxes performing that function. I don't know. Just, well, I plug this in and it rings me up and reads the error message out of the phone, which is kind of encouraging if you don't want to manipulate your error message and say, have you, for God's sake, come, it's all gone wrong. You know, ringing up your manager with that, it's not probably not a good thing. And some of my colleagues have done similar. Or do you just have an LED LCD display that just says, you know, it's all working, it's all working. Or, no, it's not. It's not the men running across. It's entirely up to you what you do with it. It's one of my favourites as well. Or put a weather station outside your building, your data centre, your house if you care, and take that data. Now you're thinking, yeah, okay, what's this? No, this is real-time data. This is real-time data that you have presented to your system, your Raspberry Pi in this case, that can be put onto your Nagio system. Say, yep, today, six feet away, it's raining. Now, you don't get a better weather forecast than that, do you, really? It's but it's just a kind of example of these things aren't intended to do that particular work, but they present an interface that you can provide into the Raspberry Pi. And once you've got that programmatic ability, why not use it? So, every presentation has a conclusion slide, I was told. This is mine. <sighs> Conversion to currency, $35. Fire and forget. Yeah. If it goes wrong, there's a bin over there. Buy another one. If the disk goes wrong, or it's corrupted, there's a bin over there. Right away, buy another one. It's quite capable of monitoring SMEs. And if you use DNX, Possibly more gear then. I haven't got that far yet. It's quite capable of doing bigger environments. Yeah. 
quite a common thing. Because suddenly you've got this hardware modular thing that's also software modular. So maybe you put another Pi in to do the PADX work. Maybe you stack them too high to do the work because you've got so many customers. It's, I think, the, possibly the easiest way to drive and monitor strange things. We've all encountered strange things in our life. Sometimes, in an industry, it's strange outputs you get from stuff that is a paper mill, that's just rolling paper. And you just get told revolutions. Now, it's, it's an interesting cal calculation to go revolutions to how much paper, because obviously the diameter <laughs> decreases as the paper comes off the roll. Uh, so maybe you want to do that kind of work to say to people, actually, you feed in the revolutions here, I'll tell you how much paper's gone there, and then I can tell Magios that you know, it's time to alert someone to get the enormous forklift truck to put some more paper on the roll. It's only limited by what you do with it. Okay, that's the point. Here and now, you can do all sorts of interesting monitoring things, but what else do you want to do? What is it that someone comes into your office or meets you in the corridor and says, ceiling leaked again last week, didn't know until it came in on Monday. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a way of knowing when the doors are open or closed that doesn't depend on someone 100 miles away in a call centre? So the challenge is for you to think of something to do with it. It does the standard things, what, but what can you do with it? card for the configuration and the, the uh, I guess, disk space, so to speak? Or is it a high-speed SD? Or it's a high-speed SD. High-speed SD, class 6. Class 6 is the minimum. Um, I've actually got a class 10 as well in there. There are issues with the disks. Now, you also have got to understand it's an SD disk, so it's not going to last forever, especially if you actually start to write to it in a big way. You want to write Magios 4 even more. <laughs> <laughs> but do you care? Oh, no, you don't, do you really? You just do. I've got an image. I'll DD the image. Nice thing is, how much does that cost me to send through the post to someone? It's lighter than the stamp. I will use to put on the envelope. Why would you not do that? Did you have to do a lot of patching to get the Nagios 4 user interface to work? I haven't tested it one bit, so it was quite cool seeing it actually work. working. <laughs> <laughs> All the CGI's kind of worked. I was impressed. So I can, I can stop doing tests altogether? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not going on record as saying that. <laughs> but uh, that was the least of my problems, I think, really. I mean, th there, is, there is a discussion to have about the hardware because it's, it's new and it's fresh and it's in short supply, for example. Um, what is it that people only ever think that a cracking, interesting device like that will only ever have 10,000 users? 10,000 on the first day, yes. And so there has been a shortage. There's a new factory, well, a factory has come on stream to build more. The other thing you'll see as it's going round is that the Raspberry Pi is kind of in your hand. It's a little circuit board and there's no mounting for it. So all the, the things that, it, it's in, what the box is in at the moment is called a thing called a pie crust. So for keeping with a culinary theme. And they all have to work by friction holding stuff in place because there's no way of lodging it the current well the absolutely latest version of the the uh, circuit board has got mounting holes in yay so you can finally screw it down to something because i think well, when in when in testing you're in testing mode you tend to have well in my case using like cat6 cables which have stiff hardly any bend radius i have raspberry pi's way on the end of the damn thing it's just a 
uh, heavier and stiffer than the actual card. Um, other than that, you have to understand it was built for a purpose. So it's built to t tip out RCA video, it's built to drive an HDMI, limited subset. The, the uh, outputs from it, the sound output is not that good, but you know, this is $35 worth of equipment. It will run XBMC, or Via Media Center for you. It'll be a network management system for you. Where is the link? No one knows, because no one's burnt one out yet. That's, that's the way it goes. That, um, if they come out of the factory, and when you plug them in, they the lights come on, then that's a good one. And no one knows, because no one's, no one's actually burnt anything out. Even, even overclocking in, and over-voltage uh, over stuff hasn't actually burnt one out. Uh, and so much so, that's why the latest release allows us to do that dynamically. Originally, it was a kind of warranty issue. If you overclocked, over-voltage the system, then no warranty. But now, after six months with a major prototype, it's not a problem. It's accepted by the manufacturer that you can do it. So, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And the thing is that there's no power supply on board. So, no, I mean, the thing that kills PCs or servers is high stereosis in the, in the, in the power supply, just the flex of the. There's no power supply. So we've eliminated that. So that kind of makes the actual device last a long time. Of course, in, a, in the average school, probably not more than about six months, I would suggest. Before they tip the coke on it or throwing it across the room or trodden on it. Yeah. Yes, you can. That's, uh, there's no problem in doing that. There's no reason not to. The nice thing is, and it wasn't really a joke about the, the supercomputer piece, is that there is a very powerful graphics display module in there. It's producing 1080p HDMI graphics at its own 256 mega cache. You can drive that to be quite a powerful processor in its own right. And part some of the classic HPC designs now are using NVIDIA cards to, because they're a lot of meat. Well, the same thing kind of approaches with the Raspberry Pi. So I suspect well, the intention is to activate that and make something out of it. Do you know if there's an open or open CL library for Raspberry Pi yet? I've not seen one, but you know what they say about open source software? <laughs> build it. If you if it's not there, build it yourself. Why not? There's a there's a virtual machine available that, that allows you to emulate the ARM processor. So which is what I did the initial part of my work on it ran like a dog. Because it's in KVM, basically, to, to, to emulate the ARM processor. But you can boot up a VM and you know, bring a source on and compile it up. You, know, so you don't actually need the hardware to do that. After I saw the <coughs> that there was going to be a, a uh, topic uh, discussed today, uh, I got interested and was looking at it <coughs> in running Raspy and Wheezy uh, on uh, the one that I have at my house. Uh, they do have a package for it, so it's just apt get install yeah. Nagios, and you're up and running it at least with with Nagios three. Yes, that's why. But the, I wanted to prove, because there's no package for DNX, for example, or more gear, but I wanted to prove that you can come from source and make your, make your choice rather than inherit the decisions made by the package maker. Sure, yeah. It, but if you just want to get Nagios up and running, it's dead easy. Yeah, it, it works. It certainly works. Uh, in the next... On the currently available release of Raspbian, there are a set of wireless drivers that are intended to be fully functional. 
I have to be careful. <laughs> the thing that, dis that disturbs me most is that the, the notes about that release and those drivers seem to imply that you're going to be using the GUI to configure your wireless interface, which makes me feel that maybe they haven't tried quite as hard as they might have done. But it's on my list. I've got, look okay, everybody does, a number of USB wireless dongles, and I'm going to get one to work. <laughs> and when I do, I'll be very happy. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a, for one of the things I'm thinking of doing with this, then that's what I need is a wireless to work. So I may not be 11N, but you know, I'll get it in the room. So the, as I say, the thing to think about is to what would you do with it? Let's go mad. Some of the cracking things I've heard, I, I didn't get a picture of it. Um, something like the, the 14th highest ever balloon trip has been taken by a Raspberry Pi. It was running a webcam, Logitech webcam, underneath a um, uh, weather balloon, and it got to 60,000 feet, twice as high as an airline it goes. So the pictures it took show the, the curvature of the Earth. And the nice thing about that was when the balloon burst, as they all do, and it came to Earth, it wasn't exactly a big package to hit someone with. This is the thing, it's like people are talking about doing robotic autonomous research because you could put a Raspberry Pi in a boat with solar panels on the top, GPS receiver, program it and wave it goodbye. And just see where it goes. What would it do? Where would it go? If you're, if you're interested in that kind of artificial intelligence and navigation or reasoning your way out of problems, well, there you are. You know, put it on a pond and see how far it goes. But <laughs> it's a bit harsh, but, but it's that sort of thing. What is it that you're going to do with this system? And what is it that you can do with Magios to help you out? I mean, all those things where people say, no, it's too hard. No, it's not. It's really not. I'd like to say it's a last chance for any questions, but give my accent and the colour of my hair, you'll be able to pick me out at any bar that we'll be in. <laughs> so if you want to talk about it anymore, just grab me. <laughs>